Hi everyone, it's Laura the Beauty Buster, and welcome to episode one of Skin Stories. You're probably wondering, what skin stories, who cares, what are you doing? Well, I am going to kind of take it back a little bit, but not always, but a little bit, take it back to when I first got into the skin game, and that was 1996. Eight, I got my license and what I started doing and reading the internet wasn't really that big back then there was I don't think there was YouTube maybe I don't know but no one was really going to the internet for their information necessarily we read books Woohoo! fun times so I have a whole banging library of skin books and so much information <clears throat> some of the information is still great some is outdated I also have, am that generation that I just like a book because I I like to just go back to it. I don't want to do a search. My eyes hurt sometimes at the end of the day. I just want to look at a book and sit in bed or take it with me. And I don't know. I'm just a book girl. So I have a whole bunch of cool books here. So every episode, this is episode one, every episode I'm going to read different excerpts from some of my favorite books, uh, all <clears throat> obviously about skin health or body healing. Um, <clears throat> how our immune system works, different things all about the health of the skin, which you know, it's not just about the skin on the outside layer, it's everything. It's really our health and um, this last year or so, <clears throat> I've become really, really into skin detoxing and detoxing the body and how that affects our skin and how to have the best health possible. Hello? Hello? little important right now. So I'm just going to show you some of my books. I mean, I have The Skin Health by Danae. I have Face Yoga by, I don't even know her name. Oh, Fumiko Taka, Takatsu. She's really cool. This is one of uh, a book I love, Dying to be Beautiful by Gwen Kay. Trust me, you will love this book. It's about the history of the beauty industry in America and how like it's completely unregulated and was back then. And only like when women started going blind with mascara did men, the lawmakers, actually care. Um, my book, Spa Wars, we have Body Reflexology, the Body Minds Workbook, and also the Louise Hay book, um, Heal Your Body, Heal Your Mind. I don't know. But if you know Louise Hay, you know what I'm talking about. You know. MLD is all about that. Uh, what else do I have? I have medical aesthetics. I don't know if these look backwards to you. Um, and of course, you know, you can't go anywhere with Dr. Pugliese. So I'm going to be reading little parts of all these books, sometimes lots of parts. The videos are not going to be that long because I know we all have short attention spans and then my voice starts to give out. But I definitely want to start educating people and it's not like I don't need to reinvent the wheel like the best of the best have already written a lot of what's out there and we're getting new information in every day so I just wanted to have some fun and educate and share and have a good time and you know say hi to people <laughs> so today's book I thought the first episode the life of the skin what it hides, what it reveals, and how it communicates. And there's going to be no editing on these because I don't edit. I'm, I'm an esthetician. That's really not my specialty. So if anybody wants to edit, feel fine. But really, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to read. I'm going to cough. I'm going to have a dry throat. And we're going to get through it. Um, and this is by two dermatologists, Arthur and Loretta Balin. And this book was one of my first books. It was actually... Uh, came out in 1997 and I got my license in 1998. So this was one of the first books on my shelf. And I wanted, just like all of you do, because I know for a fact, uh, that's what we all want is information that is not fake news. <laughs> we want the real deal. We want information that is honest, that is truthful, that is relevant, that is up to date. This is 1997. So it's, I mean, it's up to date for the most part, but you know, it's not like last year's. So there's still, but it's amazing how some of this older information, the basics are still so true and relevant. And I find that some of these older books, they talk more about the truth of the body than doctors do today. And they're much better educated in the simple truths of the body than doctors are today. 
and they were more interested in your body healing itself and getting to the root of the problem than doctors are today. So do not discount some of this older information. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, so yeah, 1997 that it came out in. And hello, their forward was written by Dr. Kligman. Okay, so if you don't know who he is, you better find out. He's a legend. And if he writes your forward, that means you know what you're talking about. I saw him speak one time in Philadelphia at a trade show. And there was only maybe a quarter of the seats were filled. And... Um, Half the people left halfway through his presentation, and I was mortified. I was just like, this is a legend. Like, everything you're doing in your treatment room, not everything, but a lot of what we're doing in our treatment rooms is because of him. So how dare you walk out on him? I don't know. I, I was not happy. So show these people respect because they've definitely earned it. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to basically read right out of their book. I'm not going to be looking into the camera that much. I'm going to give a little bit of my commentary. Not much because many of these people are way smarter than I am. And what am I really going to add to it? But we're going to make it a little bit more fun. All right. So on page 14 and the life of the skin. Oh, and I want to say, <clears throat> I mean, the first chapter... The second chapter. Well, the first chapter is what we live for, which is the skin. But the second chapter, the skin is the hero. And I mean, that's so true. It really is. The third chapter, or yeah, third is written on the skin. The fourth one is turtle woman. And the social organ. The next one is naked to the light. Uh, a vulnerable shield, the mind's hieroglyphics. Turning back the clock, my father's face lift and other family members. So he definitely, or they definitely um, get right into it and they give case studies, which I really like. So um, in the first chapter on page 14, I'm just going to start reading. Despite being encased in the cutaneous equivalent of canvas, your epidermis feels soft and pliable rather than cornified, like the shell of a turtle or an armadillo, because it is coated with a thin layer of fatty oil substance called sebum. The sebum-coated outer layer of skin protects us from physical insults, keeping vital fluids inside, life of the skin, uh, and prevents our becoming waterlogged from the outside. The waterproof stratum corneum is only one hundredth of a millimeter thick, but it is all that stands between you and the fatal mingling with the outer environment. In addition to its role, the body sheathing, the epidermis, is now known to be a major front line in the immune system. Mm, ding, ding, immune system, skin. That's why when you use all those antibacterial things, they disrupt your microbiome and the Langerhan cells. Yes. Just so, that's fine. Don't need the hand sanitizer all the time. That's kind of the worst thing you can do. But that's another story. Uh, Langerhans cells studied throughout the epidermis recognize foreign substances and present them to the other immune system cells in the blood, which then mounts an appropriate campaign against them. Langerhans cells, and if you don't know what a Langerhans cell is, go look it up. Don't just blow on by it. Like, know what you're talking about, because then when you say this to your clients, they're going to be like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Or you're going to get those clients that do know it, and they're going to be testing you. Langerhans cells are an important first line defense against environmental invaders. It seems fitting that the organ that defines the boundary between the outside and the inside worlds would be involved in the essential immune system task of distinguishing between self and other. The human body is actually a thesaurus of metaphors. I love my thesaurus. The epidermis, like the liver, is also part chemical plant. In addition to synthesizing vitamin D in the presence of sunlight, the skin is capable of modifying a variety of chemical compounds that contact it. The epidermis can also chemically inactivate dangerous substances that would otherwise be absorbed through the skin. The stratum corneum, if removed, has the same grayish transparent look regardless of race. The dermis, the thicker layer below the epidermis, is the same shade in all of us. Woohoo! The differences then are determined in the denizens of the lowest level of the epidermis known as melanocytes. These cells produce the pigment melanin, which determines the intensity of your skin's hair, 
uh, skin and hair color. All right, here we go. Number three. The epidermis has myriad textures. Think about the skin pattern and textures, such area as your elbow, your palms, the lips. Skin surface markings are equally developed on the friction surfaces of the hands and the feet where the epidermis is the thickest. The patterns of alternating ridges and valleys in these areas are called dermatoglyphics. Glyphics. I'm not really sure, but dermatoglyphics. I think it's glyphics. We'll call it that. There you go, reading off the cuff. And we shall share these features with other primates. The best known are fingerprints. They are formed in the third and fourth months of fetal life and remain unchanged through our lives. The third and fourth month. Ooh, that's amazing. What is most astounding about these are is the uniqueness of their patterns. Of the nearly 200 million sets of fingerprints on file at the FBI, no identical sets have ever been discovered. Even identical twins, whose fingerprints may bear many gross resemblances to one another, still have subtle differences. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and don't you ever forget it. Mm, I love it. Then they also have case studies in here. And... I had a piece of paper on the case study oh, and I can't find it, but here we go. So he's talking about this man that came into his office with a uh, severe itching on the skin. And so he's trying to find out what it is. Now we've all had customers come in and we cannot figure out what it is. So there's reasons why we can't, you don't have the knowledge to know. You didn't ask enough questions. They're not giving you enough information or we all don't have the knowledge and they need to be sent to somebody else. Or even if they go to a doctor, the doctor can't always figure out what it is. It is such, you have to be a Nancy Drew detective to the nth degree sometimes to figure out what is wrong with people. I've asked them the craziest questions to try and figure out what is going on and why, you know, just one side of their face is constantly breaking out. I mean... Whew. it's a never ending learning in our industry to try and help people. Like you can never ask enough questions. And usually the problems on the skin that are presented to us have nothing to do with the skin. It's in my experience, it's almost always diet, stress, bad skin routines, stress, diet, medications. All right, so here's a client that comes into him. A patient comes in with itching under the skin. In my examining room, and I like this book because they give a lot of real life examples uh, and um, a lot of really good um, ways to make us better estheticians by seeing what these doctors are doing and how they are uh, working with their clients and asking questions. And this is just a really great example. So that's why I wanted to read it. It's a little bit lengthy, but what else are you doing? Really? Okay. In my examining, examining room, I carefully read over Michael's health questionnaire, as well as the history I had taken. Now, are you taking a health history of your clients? Are you asking them a lot of questions? We've all been places, massage, facial, whatever, where they don't ask you any questions. You just lay down and they just get to work. If that ever happens, run get up off the bed and run because you're not going to get anything that's going to make any changes. They don't even know what changes they're making. Like, what are you doing? All right. So nothing in his history raised any suspicions. He took no medications and claimed never to have any allergies or hay fever, which might have demonstrated an allergic tendency. His household included no pets and nothing in his occupation suggested a trigger for the itching. I carefully combed Michael's body for any surface features that might have given a clue to the origin of his itching. But I found no rashes, visible, le visible lesions, signs of parasites, not even dry, that might explain his intense puritis. I could clearly see excoriations and scratch marks where he had tried to calm his itching. Sometimes an astute diagnostician I can't say that. Diagnosed, <laughs> dies, not, whatever. <laughs> Can uh, learn much that is quite specific from the pattern and location of the stretch marks. For instance, stretch marks in scabies are typically quite short, which reflect the length of the mites burrows, while stretch marks in pediculosis or body lice infestation tend to be several inches long, 
ugh, in keeping with the greater size of the organism's universe. Patients whose underlying problem is psychological may have deep gouges or they may have virtually no marks at all, despite dramatic complaints of constant insatiable itching. Is there any time of day when you itch more? I queried, although I had al he had already told me his itching was unpredictable. As I said, it can strike up at any time, Michael said, even at extremely inappropriate moments during my workday. But I suppose it does happen more at night, which isn't any treat either. At this point, Michael presented a clue that really spoke to me. My sleep is suffering these days, he said. I'm jet lagged all the time, so I have insomnia. And if I'm not scratching, I'm sweating. I mean, sometimes I wake up and the sheets are absolutely drenched. The worst is when I wake up itching and sweating. My wife is ready to move me into the guest room. So what would you do if your client came in with this? What questions would you ask? And this is really fascinating. And although we're not doctors, we're not diagnosing, girl, I want to help my client. So now things begin to make sense. Although a disturbing picture was emerging, night sweats tend to be harbingers of fairly serious diseases, AIDS, TB, cancers. And in my mind, the confluence of itching and night sweats weighted my diagnosis more toward a malignancy of the lymphatic system like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease. Now, let me say one thing that the light's behind me. That's right, girl. The lights don't lie. One thing, almost everything I feel nowadays is stagnant lymph and lymphatic related. Everything is lymph. And it's fascinating when you start really getting into it. Stagnant lymph can cause a lot of problems uh, and serious. Looking back over his chart, I noted again what he had said about having pain almost immediately after a drink. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew this was a lymph idiosyncratic symptom of either some type of leukemia or lymphatic cancer. I made a note and took it up later. Although my initial exploration of the body had concentrated on surface lesions, I palpated the lymph nodes of his groin, neck, and underarms for any swelling, which would be a typical sign of lymphoma, but I felt nothing. When I had finished my examination, I said, I don't see anything on your skin that I feel I can account for your itching, particularly not itching of such intensity and duration of yours. I think the next step is to do some blood tests that will give me more information to go on. I want you to have a chest x-ray and a skin test for TB. Why? Do you really think I have some kind of real problems? I mean, itching's a drag, but it's not that big a deal. Why would you want a chest x-ray? I stopped smoking 12 years ago. No one in my family's had cancer. Michael, I don't see any obvious, obvious explanation for your itching, so I need to look below the skin. In order to treat you, I have to find the correct diagnosis. All right, he said, holding his arm out. Let's get on with it. As I drew the blood from a vein in his arm, he regarded the opposite wall and said in a small vice voice, you don't think I have AIDS or anything, do you? I just saw that movie Philadelphia and it really scared me. Not that I'm gay or a drug user or anything. Have you ever been tested for HIV, I asked? No, he said warily, and I'm sure not sure I really want to be either. It's your call, but I would recommend having a test since you had mentioned having multiple sexual partners. All right, all right, he said. Do whatever you have to do. When Michael's test came back, he was <gasps> negative for HIV. His skin test was negative for TB, and his chest x-ray showed no shadows or calcifications that could have been tumors. What did it did show was an elevated white blood white cell blood count with some atypical lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell that is an important part of the body's immune surveillance against cancers and foreign proteins. Michael was also borderline anemic. When Michael was finally able to return a phone call, it was from a hotel room in Kyoto. I told him about the test results. Uh-oh, that sounds bad, Michael said, audibly deflated. Although at least it's not AIDS. That merits an extra martini. Then he cut his wisecracking tone and said, what do I do next, Dr. Pratt? I would like to consult with your interns about doing some further tests, I said. It may be more convenient for, for you to have them done in New York, or I can refer you to a doctor down here. Then, depending on the outcome of the test, we'll see if you need to come back to me or whatever you should be treated by another physician. Dr. Pratt, he spoke quietly now. It's cancer, isn't it? You know, don't you? Please tell me your gut feeling. My gut feeling is that you may have some type of blood or lymphatic system cancer, but I can't be sure without more tests. 
He gave me permission to consult his internist who decided to refer him to a cancer hospital. As it turned out, Michael's itching could very well have saved his life for, in his case, it was the earliest symptoms of Hodgkin's disease, a cancer of the lymphatic system. This type of lymphoma is usually curable, particularly when caught early. After a few weeks, I received the report from Michael's internist, which confirmed the diagnosis of, diagnosis of Hodgkin's disease. I received a note from Michael saying, I have to thank you. All these other doctors tried, but you got there first. I have every hope of being cured largely because you were on your toes and wasted no time. Thanks. As of this writing, Michael's cancer has been in remission for five years. And he comes in for his annual exam and still brings a smile to my face. That, my friends, is how you solve problems. You ask questions. You get to the source of the problem. You use all the science that you know and the science of other people. Anything you can do to get to the bottom of a problem. The skin tells us what's going on on the inside of our bodies usually. Most of the time, that's why if you're only looking at the outside, you're never going to find the solution to the problem. I work with a girl who was complaining about her acne, her acne, and she asked me, can you help me with my acne? I said, yes and no. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a loaded question. And she's like, why? I say, I see you come in here every day eating fast food, processed food, hamburgers, french fries, like crap food. And she's like, I know. And I said, there is nothing I can do for you to help you because all of your acne is coming from the inside. This is your body trying to get rid of all the crap you were eating. And she knew what I was saying was the truth, but she's just not ready to change what she's eating. So in one way, I lost a client because I didn't sell her 10 different creams and lie to her. But on the other hand, when she is ready to change, she will be a client for life because she will see results and she will trust me. And I am very quick to tell clients, it is your diet. There's nothing I can do. There's no cream. They all want to hear there's a pill. There's a cream. But there's not. And we know it. And that's one thing I really love about this book. Uh, especially it's like an old school book, I call it, you know, before the Instagram and YouTubers. They're teaching you science, not selling you crap. And so I definitely recommend this book. I'll probably do more from this, maybe another case study. But this is episode one. So it's just a little teaser of what's going to be coming. If you have any books that you love, anything you want me to read, uh, let me know. Send it to me. If you have anything that you want me to read and debunk and talk about how it is a bunch of bunk, uh, definitely send that to me. Let me know email me. Uh, you can go to thebeautybuster.com and check more out. I'll probably put these up on my blog or you can just keep listening on my YouTube channel. So thank you very much for listening to episode one. Again, this was the life of the skin. I just thought this was a very appropriate um, first episode book by Arthur and Loretta Balin. Loretta Pratt Balin, Arthur Balin. So check it out and let me know what you think of this. And if you want to see more episodes, give me likes, give me shares, share it with your friends, and I will see you all very soon. Thank you.